All right, welcome. Hi, this is Jennifer. This is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, and today we're in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. So grab your Bible, and let's get going. Let me think, yes, I did upload the Ephesians study is up and ready to go on the La Mirada Christian Church website, so you can go get the entire thing all the way through Ephesians. All done. Yay! Such a feeling of accomplishment when I, I put that last punctuation mark and say my final amens and finish up a Bible study. And Ephesians was a, a pretty big one for me to do, so I'm glad to do it. Glad to um, have all those chapters in there and done and saved for posterity and saved for you, too. So it's on the website. Go check that out and uh, follow along there if you haven't had a chance to swing by church yet. Uh, I'll have a, a few of them printed and available at church today. You can come by and get those. And for those of you who join us from far and wide, who don't live near the church, I'm really glad that you do join us. Um, you can always get it printed um, right there off of the website. All right. So grab my Bible and let's get started. Ephesians 5, 3 through 16. This is day two of week five of our study. It's a little bit longer. Each day is a little longer than a normal day in this week. And I explained a bit yesterday because that probably um, I, I would normally have done Ephesians 5 in one check, in one lesson and then moved on and done it all in Ephesians 6 in another. But um, because of our schedule at church, I wanted to get Ephesians done before we started our Hebrews uh, schedule. And doing Ephesians as a Bible study wasn't um, the original plan. I was planning on taking August off, but the Lord really impressed on my heart to do the study before our church started the Ephesians sermon series. So that's why if there's a little bit, it's a lot kind of pushed into this chapter, but it's fine. We, get, we are going to add an extra day. Normally we do five days per week of study, and this week we're going to do six, and that way we'll get well taken care of. But let's pray and get started now that you understand a little bit of what's going on this week. And then let's dive into our lesson. All right, here we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our day ahead of us. Thank you for the chance right now to be together and be in your word. Pray that you would open the eyes of our heart for understanding of your great glory, of your wisdom, and of your love for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get some water and get going. You would think after being up for an hour, working out, I could... My, my um, voice would be back, but it just takes a little while. Maybe I need you all to come over to my house and talk to me for an hour. Oh, well. <laughs> I just feel like my voice is super low and scratchy sounding today. Um, let's get to the lesson. There we go. <laughs> all right. So we're going to read from Ephesians 4 to get the setup of this chapter i want you to go back and read from ephesians 4 25 and we're going to go up and read through to ephesians 5 14. so ephesians 4 25 therefore having put away falsehood let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another be angry and do not sin do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil let the thief steal <laughs> let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you or as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, now you are, um, and now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, 
for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part of the fruitful works of the darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything becomes exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. All right, so Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 14 as our um, introduction. Oh, I would, actually, I should have updated that. really should have been all the way through to verse 16. Let me go ahead and do that. Look carefully then how you walk, not as wise, but uh, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. That's where I meant to finish. Got to get back to that. All right. And this is why we edit as we go. <laughs> so that was to verse 16, which it matches at the top, but I for forgot to update it when I added those two verses in. Okay. Behind the scenes in the Dwelling Witchley Bible Study. That's how we do it, right? So if you've got the one that you just printed off of the website, it'll be updated soon. I always try to go back and fix those. Let's do this read and respond part now, okay? Before going on to the sins that Paul admonishes against, let's clarify one thing, that if we are diligent in our focus, we'll actually eliminate any need for spelling out a list of sins to avoid or behaviors to emulate. Read Ephesians 4, 30, 5, 1, and 5, 2 and write down upon what should our life be centered. So let's go back to Ephesians 4.30, where it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, okay? And Ephesians 5.1, remember it says, be imitators of God, as dearly loved children, right? And then Ephesians 5.2, walk in love as Christ loved us. All right. So a little bonus here for you, number two. What theological or God word theological, so theos and, and logos are the two words that combine together to make the word theological. That's from the Greek theos and logos. Theos means God, logos means word. So what theological word truth um, is communicated in those three verses? We have don't grieve the Holy Spirit, be imitators of God, and walk in love as Christ loved us. The Holy Spirit and God and Christ. What do you see there? Theological word, the Trinity. The Trinity. A word that's not mentioned per se, but a word um, that's used to explain the Godhead. That God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three in one. The Trinity. All right. But we need details, don't we? We, it is not enough to say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit or imitate God or walk like Jesus. Wouldn't that be nice if it was? What would you have to do in order to live that without that in order to live that out without a detailed do don't list of behaviors think of it this way if you wanted to play like mozart what would you have to do you'd have to know mozart you'd have to listen to his music all the time so you could play like him right so in order to walk like god not grieve the holy spirit uh, or walk like christ imitate god and not grieve the holy spirit Ooh, ooh, big yawn just came over me. <laughs> we need to know God. We need to understand him. We need to spend time with God. Super simple, right? We don't need a list of do's and don'ts if our life is truly focused in that way. But it isn't. We get busy and we don't imitate God. We don't walk with Christ like that. And we do grieve the Holy Spirit. So if you're not imitating God, who are you imitating or whom are you imitating or modeling your life after? That's kind of a black and white. It's one or the other. Create a table now, chapter 5, verses 3 to 14, and the differences you read between those who are imitators of God and those who are not. And I left that part blank for you. I'd like you to, you to fill that in on your own. But what does it look like to be imitators of God versus being imitators of Oh, well, Satan. And the, the character traits from verses 3 to 14 that show that. All right. So um, back in chapter 4, or um, yeah, 4. No, no, 5. We're in 5 now. Yeah, chapter 5. 
but sorry, <laughs> two from five, three to 14. Um, sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, not even named among you. So you're totally pure over here if you're imitating God. Imitating Satan, sexually immoral, impure, covetous. And let there be no filthiness, foolish talk, or crude joking, which are out of place. Instead, let there be thanksgiving, imitating God, thanksgiving, imitating Satan, filthy, foolish, crude. You may be sure of this, that everyone is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, which he's just mentioned. That's an idolater, that idolater over there with Satan. No inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Imitate God, you have an inheritance in Christ and God. And let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, imitators of Satan, sons of disobedience, children of wrath, as it says in Ephesians 2. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, Satan, but now you are light in the Lord, imitating God. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and pure or true, imitators of God. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Put a circle around that whole part of your, of your chart that you're creating there. Circle that whole thing. Discern what is pleasing to the Lord. There it is. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, imitating Satan. Extend, expose them. That's imitating God. For it is shameful to even speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Light is God. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, Christ, um, arise in the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise as Satan, but as wise. That's God. Making the best of the time, that's God, because the days are evil. That's Satan. You see it? There's always that pattern that you can look for. But that's who we need to be, imitators of God, and fill that in, and that's our focus. Don't focus on not imitating Satan. Focus on just imitating God. Make that your focus. All right. The Ephesians lived in a very sexually immoralized or immorally sexualized society. Sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like ours today? Recall from our first lessons that um, that if Ephesus was the center of worship for the fertility goddess Diana, be mindful that immorality or immorally sexualized society that in regards to sexuality, the two alternatives before us are not immoral sexuality or no sexuality. The two alternatives held out before us in scripture are a godly view and practice of sex and an ungodly, immoral view and practice of sex. God created sex. Sex is good. Sex is good within the bounds of uh, God's parameters in marriage between a man and a woman who are married together. And uh, there is no other way that that can be explained in scripture other than that. But just like anything um, that God has created outside the parameters that God has given us to enjoy it, it's bad. And so um, enjoying um, something that we see good outside the bounds, enjoying and coveting after it, bad, right? Wanting to do well with your life, but being consumed with your career, bad, right? So anything outside the parameters of how God has prescribed for us to live is, is sin. And then with, within that, all those good things are from God. So what should there be instead of these sins? In verse 4, we read this, thanksgiving. Instead of those sins, thanksgiving. Instead of filthy talk and crude talk, thanksgiving. Why? What could thankfulness have to do with avoiding those sins? Why mention thankfulness right there? Filthy talk, crude talk, don't be covetous, but instead be thankful, have thankfulness. Well, how about rather than filling your heart and your mind with coarse talk and, and, and the filthiness, fill it with thankfulness for all that you have. When our mouth is so busy being thankful, it doesn't have room inside of it to be coarse and rude and disrespectful with how we're talking. So let's give some examples from Ephesians 5.4 and consider how you can be mindful to be filled with thanksgiving instead of um, the, these filthiness, foolish, and crude talking in your life. So um, filthiness, the Greek word there is asphra, ice, cross. And it's only used this one time in the New Testament, and it, it means nasty, improper, or sordid. And it's translated here in the ESV as filthy. So um, don't spend too much time thinking about this, but I, I kind of want us to walk through that. Just think through, what does that look like in real life? What does it look like to be filthy in the way I speak about things? And be careful how my mouth is speaking. Write down your example there. Foolish talk. Uh, the Greek word is morologia, literally foolish 
plus words. There's logia or logos again that we saw with theo logos, or theos and logos. Um, and it is also used only this one time in the New Testament, foolish talk. Um, so literally words that a fool would speak. Now a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So that would be among foolish talk, talking about things that um, deny the truth of who God is. That's foolish talk. Crude joking. A Greek word is eutrapelia, eutrapelia. And it literally means well, that's the U-E-U, trapelia, tuned. Eutrapelia is well tuned. And once again, it's only used this one time in the New Testament, and it carries with it the sense of facetiousness and low humor, humor that's designed to dig and, and, and debase somebody else, pointing out to somebody else. So think of an example there of crude joking and um, how people and you maybe struggle with that. And maybe that's an issue that you need to bring to the Father today and confess and ask for help and getting past that, filling your heart instead with thankfulness. So what connection do you see between the sins in um, five, chapter five, verse three and verse four? So in, in verse three, we see sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, and then let there be no place for filthiness, foolish talk, or crude joking. Do you see a connection there? Sexually immoral and coveting and impurity, and then this crude joking, sure. Generally speaking, crude jokes are sexual in nature. They're body parts in nature. Right? So we see that connection between those things there. So how seriously does God take these sins? Just joking around, right? Just crude joking. 5-3, five, 5-5, three, five, 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 all, all in there. Well, he says that those who practice them will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty serious. <laughs> That's kind of you know, go, with, go at it with that way. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, where it says, or do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And again, in um, Thessalonians 5, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, reject every kind of evil, test all things, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's from the Berean Study Bible, by the way. All right, so none of those things have any place in the Christian life and God takes them very seriously. So let's not be dismissing and dismissive of um, our sins because they're, you know, just crude joking. What, is teach, what does this teach us about uh, um, who is truly a child of God? I see in here that we take sin seriously and that we are focused on the purity of God and we wouldn't even think of having unholiness or impurity in our life. I want to take a moment right now to consider letting only words of thankfulness come out of your mouth today. Stuck in traffic? Thankfulness. Someone cuts in front of you? Thankfulness. A work issue remains unresolved? Thanksgiving. Thankfulness. A friend or a spouse is annoying you? Thankfulness. Those are the things that keep us focused on God and his holiness. What caution or consequence does Paul give in chapter 5, verse 6? It says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God came, uh, comes upon the sons of disobedience. So considering what he's been admonishing against in chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, what might be the kinds of empty words someone could speak to deceive one of Paul's readers? Well, they could be speaking what I basically just said. Those types of sins are no big deal. It's not that big of a deal. I'm just joking around, very dismissive of our sin life. When he's just said, be imitators of God, don't act like this, and don't listen to people who want to dismiss that type of behavior. And don't do it yourself. Who is the them that Paul is referring to in verse 7 there? Well, those are the sons of disobedience. Those are the ones who deceive. And what reminder does Paul give in chapter 5, verse 8, in the following verses? So look also to uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and 2, 12. Well, back in, if you remember back in 2, verse 1 and 2, he's talking about 
sons of disobedience back there as well, children of wrath. And, and also in chapter 2, verse 12, he's talking about how we had no hope and we were without God, right? So in, the, in that state, you're acting like, again, you have no hope and you have no God. You aren't, in, you are not sealed with an, there's that fly I was telling you about from last night. You are sealed with an inheritance if you're imitators of God, if you're living a life of love as Christ loved us, right? And when you're not, it's not that you're saved, not saved, saved, not saved. It's, are you, have you given your life to God? Are you renewed by the Holy Spirit in the first place at all? There's no place for any of that evil talk. And there's no place then to be dismissive about it and to listen to deceitful words about it and to basically um, talk that way and then not repent. There's one thing to sin and stumble. We all do that. Um, and then to recognize that, but it's another thing altogether to sin and stumble and just keep on stumbling. I would submit to you that that is the difference between someone who is a child of disobedience or a child of wrath and has not come in under the covenant of God and someone who has and fully given their life to the Lord. You have a conviction of sin over here and you have a dismissal of sin over here. So how does our current life in Christ differ radically from our former life? Read Ephesians 5, 8. It says, at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The Greek word translated walk here, one of my favorite Greek words, I think because my dad taught it to me as a little kid, but it's peripateo. Maybe also because it's fun to say peripateo. But um, peripateo or peripatetic is the describing of that. And it's, it's literally meaning walk around um, the circumference, going around something. Um, not because you're avoiding it, it's a, the walking around in your life. The Hebrew mindset, it, and it has a sense of how one conducts one life. So you're walking, how you're walking in and around and conducting yourself in your life. Note the strength of Paul's admonition. He's not saying that we were in the light now as children of God, but that we, we are literally what? We are literally light, all right? Not just in the light, but we are literally light ourselves. What did Jesus say about th that in, in that regard? Um, if you go back to Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 14, I'm sure this verse will be very familiar to many of you. And I'll read it again out of the Berean Study Bible. It says, you are salt of the earth, but if salt loses its savor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So that was 13 and, and 15 sandwiched around verse 14. Um, but what did Jesus say there? Plain and simple. We're the light of the world. All right. So considering Paul's words in verses 3 through 9 there, I paraphrase verse 10. Take a look at verse 10. The, um, and, and let's Go back, I'll go back to that so you can read that out loud too. But Ephesians 5, verse 10, um, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So, how would you put that into your own words? I like the way that the J.B. Phillips uh, paraphrased this verse. It reads like this Let your lives be living proofs of the things which please God. It, has, it carries with it the sense, not just like, I'm going to try to figure out what God wants me to do but that that our life is the proof of the things that lit, that please god my life is a living proof of the things that actually do please god it's an interesting way to to think of it all right so what place should pleasing god have in your daily life and how could you adjust your prayer life to reflect this priority all right when you wake up in the morning when we get up and we get started in our day that should be top priority. I know some of you have little kids at home that you're engaging with and getting to school and, and taking care of them. And others of you are empty nesting. And then we have people all, way, all the way in between, right? Our priority is our children, our, our husband, our, our job responsibilities, our home, right? We think about that. What if we trump all of that and are imitators of God above everything? And our first priority in the morning as we're getting up is pleasing God and having that as our top priority in our life. So Micah 6, 8 and Romans 8, 8 are fabulous reminders of this as well as we bring that all together. Let's take a look at Micah 6, 8. And I'll read that out of the ESV. It says, he has told you, O man, what is good, 
And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? And Romans chapter 8, verse 8, another great verse, one that you might want to consider memorizing it. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And here's how the, the Berean study Bible says, uh, because the mind of the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not controlled by the flesh, but by the spirit. If the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So summarize what it does and doesn't please God. Doing the will of God pleases God. But to live uh, to do justly, to walk humbly with your Lord, um, to uh, to live not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And any other scriptures that you have there to support your answer, go ahead and continue with that. So what's your role as a child of God in the unfruitful works of darkness? And that's 511. And then also let's read James. Um, we've done this before in our study, but James 5, 19 through 20. My brothers, if any of you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So Paul reminds us here to have nothing to do um, with the fruits of darkness, with the sons of disobedience, with the deceptive talk, but to expose it by speaking the truth. Remember that from Ephesians 4, 15, speak the truth in love. And Ephesians 4, 25, that we would speak the truth to one another. So what should we be doing? What's our role as a child of God in the unfruitful works of darkness? Well, don't partake in them. That's not our role. Don't be partaken in them. Instead, expose them. Is that something you're willing to do today? Why or why not? It's hard. Do you think it's hard sometimes to expose that? Why? Because we live in a society that when darkness is exposed, the dark shouts back to the light, don't you judge me? Who are you to judge me? And you're right. We're not there to judge. And you're not judging when you expose something. When I open up my refrigerator and the light goes on, I'm not judging anything in there. If I reach in and grab something that out and bad and stinky, I can judge whether it's bad or not. And I can make a decision on that and toss it out. But that's not us to do in our Christian walk. We're not tossing anything out. All I'm doing is opening up the refrigerator door and exposing it to the light. Bring light to the situation so that God can do the sorting out. That somebody else can see and, and, and notice what's going on. Let the Holy Spirit work in somebody else's life. And don't be afraid of people who wield scripture inappropriately, who do not rightly divide the word of truth, as it says, and use a verse like, don't you judge me when you're only exposing the light. Um, exposing um, their darkness with your light. Um, your role is not to judge. That's up to God to judge, but you are to make a judgment call. In other words, you are to discern what's right or wrong, and then God can handle the rest of that. All right? So once again, like in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, Paul not only refers back to an Old Testament. Remember, it's called the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Eventually, I might get to the place in the Bible study where I don't have to keep on putting in parentheses what I mean when I say Old Testament, because to be honest with you, my preference would be that we never started calling it the Old Testament to begin with. We should have always um, called it maybe the Foundational Testament or um, the Tanakh, which is what the Jews call it, okay? Um, old just makes it feel like it's old. It's the old stuff. What do we do with old things when we toss them out, right? And people have done that, unfortunately, with the Old Testament. So that's why I'm kind of on a mission to retrain people to either call it the, the Tanakh, which is what the Jews call their, their Old Testament, or um, to or they call it their Bible, or uh, to call it the Foundational Testament. Okay, that's the side note for you. All right, once again, like in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, Paul not only refers back to the Old Testament, to the Tanakh, but he places it in the context of, excuse me, of the new life we have in Christ and offers a new and practical interpretation and application. So read Ephesians 5, um, 13 to 14, along with Isaiah 9, 2 and Isaiah 61, and then apply it in a practical way to your life today. So let's go back to Ephesians 5. Let me get that called up again here. 
But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Now let's take a look at Isaiah 9, verse 2, and Isaiah 60, verse 1. These are the verses that Paul is re referencing back to. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And 60 verse 1, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So applying it in a practical way to our life, the light is capable of showing up everything for what is, it really is. It's really even possible, after all, it happened to you, for light to turn the thing it shines upon into light also. You, as a believer, that happened to you, right? So therefore, God is speaking through the scriptures. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So this is Christ speaking into us and Paul reminding us of this truth from Isaiah and from um, Isaiah 9 and then from Isaiah 60. And Ephesians 5, um, 5 through 16. I'd like you to try to read this from the Amplified Version if possible. If you're using the online PDF, you can use the clicking link that I provided for you here and click through and follow that. I, I set it up to go right to the Amplified Version. But if you can't, it's fine. Read it out of your Bible. What does Paul admonish here that we are to do and for what reason? Underline in your Bible the words that indicate urgency need for awareness, and an active, not a passive faith. Let's read what it says. This, again, is out of the um, Amplified Version. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, purpose, courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of every opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence, because the days are filled with evil. I love the Amplified Version. Get a copy of the Amplified Version Bible if you can. Um, if you can't, just get the online version of it. It's so helpful when you're reading through Scripture. So um, make sure you underline the verses in your Bible that indicate urgency and doing something now and having a sense of an awareness and active faith, not a passive faith. Underline all that in your Bible. What are three specific ways that you can make changes in your routine today so that you can truly truly make the most of your time. We all have 24 hours in a day, folks, 168 hours in a week. That's it. That's what you got. I don't have any more than you do. And you might look at someone else's life and go, how do they have time to exercise? I can never make time. Or how do they make time to really do this Bible study? I don't have time. Like, yeah, you do. You do have time. You have the same amount of time they did. What you have is a shift of priorities. If you want to exercise, you get up earlier so you can exercise. If you want to spend more time in the word, you shift something out of your life so you can move the Bible in and spend time in the word. Um, so what are the changes that you can make in your routine that you can truly make the most of your time? I would like you to take an inventory of what, how you're using your time and decide, is there anything I'm doing in my life right now that can, I can pitch it. I don't need to be doing that. Maybe for some of you, it's being on Facebook or social media and you need to say, I need to either limit my time or get off social media, period. Instagram, Facebook, trolling YouTube videos, all that kind of stuff. That's a time sucker. I know, guilty. I've totally done it myself. So when I realize I'm spending more time there than I am in the Word or that I am in exercising, I realize I got some priorities out of whack, right? I need to get that up and fixed. So write down yours right there. And close your time today in prayer that your understanding of what it looks like to be light and to walk as a child of light would deepen all right. Pray for boldness to live this life as a true imitator of God. Can you do that today? I think that's a good prayer. All right. And then write and practice your memory verse. Whatever you decided to memorize, get ready to do that. And tomorrow we're going to be jumping right back into Ephesians, of course, um, verses 17. And then we're going to be moving all the way into um, chapter six, verse nine. Cool stuff tomorrow. Part one, we're going to take that whole chunk and we're going to split it into two days. Great stuff ahead. So get ready for that. I'm looking forward to it. And I look forward to being back here tomorrow morning with you and spending time with you in the Word. Don't forget, our in-person new Bible study begins next week, Monday night at 6.30. Come early if you want dinner. We'll be having dinner at 6, Monday night at 
and um, great Tom's tailgate feast for everybody. Bring um, husbands and wives together because we have a great Bible study um, with the men. Our pastor Shane is going to be going through the A through Z essentials of the Christian walk and as within a kind of an apologetic focus. In other words, how do we really shore up what we believe and understand in our faith and defend it? And I'm looking forward to that study. My husband will be going through that this year. And then we'll be downstairs with the women going through the entire book of Ephesians. So please make time to come out and do that. And I'd like you to consider three people that you can share this post with today. Tag them in it. Share with them and say, I'm doing this Bible study. Here's what I learned. And I'd love for you to join me. And let's get the word out and encourage our friends to join us. So think of three people that you can tag in this post and listen to the study. But also um, see if you can invite them to come to Bible study and join us in person starting next week. That's Monday uh, at 6.30 p.m. or Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. We meet on the second and fourth weeks of the month. Easy to remember that way. Look at your calendar. If it's a second or fourth Monday, come. If it's a second or fourth Tuesday, come. And uh, you can always find us there. All right. Have a great rest of your day. God bless you. And um, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. 7.30 or 7 o'clock-ish. Bye-bye for now.